Hey everybody, this is Nate Smoyer, and you're listening to the Tech Nest Podcast. This is the show where we sit down with the leaders in real estate and technology to find out what they're doing to transform the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. If you've got an interest in real estate and technology, stick around. You're in the right place. Okay, we've got a great show for you today. We have the CEO, Thomas Kutzman, of a company called Preview, and they are really working to help buyers recoup some of the built-in expenses when buying real estate. So imagine this, I'm on the site right now, I'm checking out their calculator and, you know, I'm running the, the estimates on a property in New York City. You know, it's New York City, so it's going to cost a million bucks. And the total closing cost is coming out to about $38,000. But if you were to work with Preview, you could get about 20000 of that rebate it back to you. And they've already sent back millions of dollars to consumers in just the last two years through their own process of how they're doing this. Additionally, they're not just working a referral network. They've got the agents in-house and they're salaried. So they're really challenging what we know as the brokerage model. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. I love the direction they're going, especially the focus that Thomas has placed on building a brand. So kick back, relax, enjoy. Wait, well, hey, Thomas, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nate. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate you taking time uh, later in the evening. Uh, both of us kind of have uh, the challenging uh, uh, task of finding time to, to be able to talk, but I uh, appreciate you taking the side time. Uh, but hey, before we get into it too far along, uh, I'd like to kick it off the standard way. Why don't you let everyone know who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Thomas Kutzman. I'm a co founder and co CEO of Preview. Uh, we're a digital home buying platform focused on saving home buyers money. Uh, we recently raised our seed round of financing uh, in September, and uh, you know, obviously happy to be on the podcast. Was a former podcaster myself, so um, <laughs> yeah, always happy to make time for you. Yeah, so as soon as we wrap up, I'm going to want from you the give me the feedback. What did I do right, and what could I do better? Yeah, no, for for sure. <laughs> um, well, let's get into the the details here. Uh, you, you describe yourself as uh, you, you know you're helping home buyers in a it's totally a little bit of a different way than a lot of people are probably familiar with hearing. Uh, let's start with first. What is the primary problem you're looking to solve? Sure, I, I think uh, you know Preview was formed out of mine and my co-founders' frustration with the industry. You know the the fees are you know, exorbitantly high uh, in the U.S. You know commission rates are two to three times what they are in the rest of the developed world. Uh, you know, so there's clearly a high fee frustration there, um, but also just how antiquated the process is, how fragmented uh, those consumer experiences are between you know, the buyer and the agent. Uh, so we felt like there, there had to be a better way, especially in a, a more digital world, uh, to create a best, better customer experience. And as a result of that efficiency, uh, to pass along savings to the home buyers. Right. And let's talk about those savings right now because commissions are actually a pretty hot topic when we're talking about residential real estate. Obviously, there's the antitrust suits that the National Association of Realtors has to deal with. A lot of challenges to the the structure of commissions. Um, What are you guys doing to actually bring the savings and pass them along to the consumer? Sure. So we pass along two thirds of the commission, the buyer's commission we receive for representing buyers. So on average, we've saved home buyers, you know, about twenty three thousand dollars per transaction. Wow. Uh, so when you're when you're looking at like a, an area like New York, which was our which was our first market, uh, you know, the magnitude of the savings is, is pretty impactful. Um, but when you're really able to you know, improve that customer experience to make the agent efficiency from the technology we use, uh, mm-hmm. it really allows us to pass along that savings that uh, you know, traditional agents are just not able to provide due to their cost structures. Yeah, you know, I mean, I know from experience, like the the topic of commission is like one of the biggest stressors, uh, you know, especially if you're the listing agent to have that discussion with your clients, but you're, you're coming at it like you're putting it out there and making the model a little bit more transparent so that that conversation isn't, you know, happening when the, the buyer or seller looks at the settlement statement, which a lot of times that's really the only time the discussion around commissions is happening is on the, the settlement statement. Right. That's where feelings really get hurt, I think, or, you know, buyer's remorse kicks in. Yeah, we, we couldn't agree more. And you know, when, when we first started looking at this problem, we originally, you know, did our research around the seller part of the transaction, given, 
it's the the seller that's signing the the listing agreement. They're setting you know the commission rate with their negotiation with their listing agent. Um, but buyers are unaware of what buyers brokers are getting paid, and in many cases they're only finding out at the closing table. And yeah. you know there's that half truth perpetuated by the traditional part of the industry that it's free to be represented. And <laughs> while it's you know obviously we we, we joke about it, but um, you know, when you look at it, if you're showing up with all of the money and an intermediary is getting, you know, some sort of compensation, it's coming out of the buyer's pocket. It might not show up as a cash line item on the closing statement. Um, right. You're the one showing up with all the money. So it's, it's, it's still synthetically affecting your price and, and the affordability of your home. Yeah, that, that whole uh, don't worry, my services are free is the number one reason that uh, I will stop talking with an agent if they use that. Because because it's just not that's not true, you know. When when I hear buyers agent talk, well, they, they they use that line is like, "Don't worry, you don't have to pay me. My services are free." That's just not true. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the frustration people have with uh, real estate agents in general. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of hardworking real estate agents out there, so you know, we we, we don't you know look at it as a combative nature with the with the industry. Uh, we just look at it as like, you know, we believe there should be an increased level of transparency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even with, you know, the, the lawsuits that are out there in the, in the courts, you know, I think a lot of it is about consumer protection. It is about transparency. And I think with what we're doing in, in passing along these, these transparent rebates of two thirds of the buyer's broker commission, it, it ends up being far more transparent. Um, and it, it gains a lot more trust with uh, the home buyers that we're working with. Yeah. Yeah, let's shift a little bit. So you guys are currently, your first market was New York and you've recently expanded into Connecticut, right? That, that's correct. Yeah, so obviously most people are like, why did you pick New York? It's you know, one of the most difficult real estate it's, markets. It's so in, competitive there. In the world. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the last time I checked the stats, I think there's 30,000 real estate agents going after 15,000 uh, transactions uh, every wow. year. So I think there's a lot of part-time agents. It is very competitive. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, if you can solve New York, um, being one of the more nuanced market, this will, will work dramatically in, in all of the major metropolitan you know, tier one cities. Uh, you know, we did recently expand to, to Connecticut. Uh, and yeah, when so we break that one down. Why not Rhode Island? They're right there. <laughs> well, you know, when you looked at New York City, uh, you know, when the first natural thing is, you know, when you're marketing channels, you know, people learn about you brand awareness. But there's a lot of folks that are buying in New York City, but there's also a lot of folks that are relocating from New York City to the New York City suburbs, Connecticut being one of them. Mm. Uh, so, so there's a natural you know, halo of you know, almost a reverse inquiry of, hey, you're helping New Yorkers help buy, but like, can you help me in Connecticut? Can you help so me? They're, they're, they're probably doing the commute you know, from Connecticut because you know, I, I remember when I was building homes in Pennsylvania, you know, we were building for New York residents in Pennsylvania specifically. So they're doing the commute, they're seeing the brand, they've heard of it, and they're wondering when they can get it. So that's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, and we, we looked at it like, you know, when we think of ourselves as a, a mission-oriented company focused on saving home buyers money, uh, you know, the natural instinct, both is from a mission com- part of the company and from a, a business proposition, uh, you know, going after the highest price point cities where we can have the most impact for the consumer. Right. It makes a lot of sense. And obviously then, so it sounds like the probably next logical move would be somewhere else than in the New York, the, the Northeast is for expansion. Yeah. So we haven't formally disclosed uh, the cities we're going to, uh, we're setting up the final paperwork on our, our licensing. Mm-hmm. Um, but as part of our, our recent seed round, uh, you know, part of that money will be going to entering uh, new markets. That makes sense. Now I, I, I know that we, we talked about this on the, on the uh, initial call that you and I had, but I wanted to go into how you're structured because you know, in the re, I'm going to just call it the rebate business. I don't know rebates as a service. I'm going to coin that term. I don't know if that's a thing in real estate yet. It's catchy. I, I mean, I work on a lot of our marketing efforts, so uh, you know, it's definitely catchy. We'll, we'll <laughs> so, in the rebate as a service business, uh, there's two structures I find that we come across. You find one that's really just true referral network. They've got a marketing machine. It captures leads, and then they send the lead to an agent at, you know, some brokerage through some partnership and they get a cut of that commission and they call it good. And then there's the other side where you actually do the really hard work of establishing a brokerage with agents and you're working your own leads that you're generating. Which one did you guys choose and why? Yeah. So, so we believed, you know, very strongly, you know, from the onset that we wanted to really build a brand 
where there was a consistency from start to finish for the consumer experience. So, you know, we, we know there are other models that have attempted rebates with, you know, that being pure lead gen and just passing it off to you know, partner agencies. Um, while that may work for some, we think to really, you know, revolutionize this business, um, there needs to be a consistency of training, a consistency of where every interaction you have with the brand uh, is at the same caliber. Um, uh, so I think that starts from the structure of uh, how we, you know, how we pay our agents, the structure of how we train our agents, um, and the technology that we're using from the consumer experience as well as from the, uh, from the agent experience. So on the consumer experience, right? Like if you're passed off to a, a referral partner, you're going to be taken to the same fragmented um, you know, experience of an off, more offline with you know, text, email, et cetera, people calling you. And nobody wants to deal with that you know, high pressure agent, right? Mm-hmm. Where we believe that we're actually changing that experience, making it far more zero pressure. Uh, you know, we like to use the, the phrase that we're a friend in the early miles and an expert in the last mile. And we're introducing you to an agent on the preview platform that's trained by preview uh, at the optimal time for your experience based on your interactions on the platform. It makes a lot of sense. And I, you also mentioned something in there about like, you know, being deliberate about how you pay agents. Uh, are you guys, are you moving in the direction of salary agents, right? I, I believe we had that discussion. Yeah, that's correct. So, so we, we're big believers in investing in our agents and in, in our people. We, we think that, you know, if a better agent will be someone that has stability in their life, that has a salary, that has health benefits, um, that has much more predictability in their life. And I think that's going to lead to a better customer service. Uh, and, you know, and when we look at the, the agent journey um, and providing a great level of customer service, we think that agents uh, are becoming much more of an advisor and less of the, you know, eat what you kill independent contractor. So we envision a world that's more of a sales organization, similar to, you know, software sales organization or, or other sales based organizations um, where you have a much more collaborative approach. Um, and by having the technology and having the ability to help guide people via the platform, uh, it leads to a much richer experience for, for the consumer by having that salaried agent that's really focused on the transaction and not trying to, to uh, acquire new customers. I've noticed this trend with, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, residential brokerage space that, you know, if you can help reduce the stress and anxiety on the agent, whether that's by building up a team or, you know, in this case, you're bringing far more stability to the income that's coming in. You know, for people who love the business, maybe don't necessarily want to build a business and run a business. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, they'll be happier in what they're doing. They'll be, they'll be more productive, which means I can actually focus on the client rather than all the other things that, you know, as an independent agent, you just, there's, there's a million and one things to do. And you're talking about the competitiveness of New York, staying on top of that and the market and following up with your clients. I mean, something's got to give, so you just can't do all of it. Right. And, and the way we do in our research and, and how we looked at the problem was, you know, how do agents spend most of their time? So if you look at the traditional agent experience, Agents are spending 70 to 80% of their time trying to find a client to work with and only about you know, 20 to 30% of the time actually servicing those clients. Wow. So we thought that if we can come up with a proprietary way of uh, connecting with folks digitally and being that lead engine for the brand, our agents can spend 100% of their time focused on the transactions. And mm-hmm. when you look at, you know, obviously it's been you know, well publicized that you know, firms like Compass, I think Inman News had a piece on it you know, earlier in the year. The average compass agent does four to five deals per year. The average preview agent does 36 deals per year. Wow. So it's a, a much more efficient model where they can focus on the customer transaction and not just trying to uh, you know, acquire leads. I was going to make a joke about something along the lines. You said the, there was a recent compass article on Inman and I'm pretty sure that was always yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and, and, and not and again, not to not to you know make fun, but like we have a, we have a ton of respect for what Compass is, has done in terms of yeah. you know, raising the visibility of bringing technology to the industry. Uh-huh. Um, but you know, I think there'll be a Harvard Business School case study on them about branding and marketing. Oh, um, absolutely, hands but, down. But when you think they they haven't been as disruptive uh, as they could have been. 
Mm. Uh, when you think about it, you know, they're, they're a better version of a, a Douglas Elliman or, or a Realogy brand company, right? They, they still charge very high fees. Um, and so the consumer doesn't really save in, in their benefits. So, you know, we're believers when, you know, I used to be an equities trader focused on the technology sector. And, you know, when you look at e-commerce, when you look at hospitality, when you look at travel as industries, it, the people that truly disrupted a category are the folks that save people money. Yeah. So, you know, again, I mean, that's where the big, that's the biggest audience. Exactly. Right. And residential real estate is the largest market in the country. Hmm. And so when you think of the, the huge opportunity here, you know, this starts with, you know, brokerage. So you can be saving folks money in the brokerage area, um, right. who, you know, grow and you know, there's much more uh, of a buyer's journey that you can help save people money on. It makes a lot of sense. And now uh, not to, I'm also not throwing any digs at uh, compass. It just feels like everyone's like, I feel like I see them in the news every day, but um, you know, I guess that comes with uh, the territory. Um, let, let's talk about the details though, a preview. I'd like to walk through the process. So I'm a buyer. I hear a preview. Uh, I go to the site. I fill out a form, walk me through the process, how I go from just hearing about you guys and inquiring to then getting matched with an agent and closing on a deal. Sure. Yeah. So uh, again, I, uh, I like to use the phrase that we're a friend in the early miles and an expert in the last mile. And the, so when you arrive on previous site as a, as a new buyer, uh, you're, you know, seamlessly walk through a, a simple multi-step onboarding um, that really captures what you're looking for, you know, price, size, location. I um, mean, you know, we're not trying to reinvent uh, you know, the search process that that's the ubiquitous part of, of any model nowadays. Um, but you, you quickly see an index of listings that match your criteria. Uh, you see transparently on every single listing how much you could potentially save. So when you're comparing us, like versus, a tradi- us versus a traditional broker, you'll see that you're going to save $23,000, $27,000 on the specific uh, property compared to zero with a traditional agent. On every single listing page, you can click a button to schedule a viewing and our team handles it for you. Uh, you can message directly on the platform with a member of our team. Uh, in the early moments, it's a, more of a concierge customer success, you know, early, easy questions. So uh, it's not a high pressure uh, you know, sales that you would experience in a traditional sense. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then if you're ready to make an offer, you can click make an offer and automate uh, the situation. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to a tour, um, an agent will accompany you and you'll, that's usually when one of the first points where you're assigned an agent. And an agent is seamlessly then added to your messaging stream. So it's, it's a, a, a more of a platform experience consistent with what people are experiencing in other parts of their life. Uh, so again, zero pressure, putting the control in your hands without that, that high pressure situation. And so then, your platform allows a buyer to, they can, they, they get connected, you're, you're offering up a portion of the uh, commissions as a rebate, but they could even write the offer. Yeah, so they so they there's an offer automation process, so they can begin the offer. And prior to submitting an offer, you're 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 paired with that agent. Uh, and in many okay. cases, some, in many of our our deals uh, are direct offer. People have already you know, been on the platform, and their first interaction with an agent is the, is preparing for the offer process to discuss negotiation <laughs> strategies, discuss comps. Uh, and what helps people get there and, and gives them a lot more of that control. Um, is the ability you get property alerts every day, every Friday you get open house alert emails. Mm-hmm. It really guides the behavior in such a way where it can be much more self-service and a much more elevated and sophisticated uh, experience because everything's in one place for you. Your tours agenda is there for you. You can see listings, you're getting an alert system. You have someone there to help you with the simple questions. And when you're ready to make an offer, you have a local expert from the team uh, you know, and that they're doing such a high level of volume, they know the area and actually have more expertise uh, than a traditional agent who only does four or five deals per year. One one thing I really like about one of your online tools uh, is the calculators that you guys have. So I, I'm like, yeah. not even thirty seconds. I typed in a price, a percent down payment. You know, it told you know figures out how much that is. Typing condo, not new development, and it immediately pulls together all the closing costs, the you know estimated closing costs. And obviously, New York City has 
some special ones. Yeah, and, New, York, New York City has has some, and, <laughs> and and some politicians have recently jacked some of them up even more uh, you know, in the last few months. Yeah. Um, but when we when we think when we think about the process and when we think about ourselves as a brand of of not only savings and transparency, but we really want to educate the home buyer. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's a it can be a stressful process at times. Obviously, it's you know less stressful to buy a home than to sell a home. Um, but we really try to create tools to educate them, create content to educate them. You know, we have a very uh, you know, vigorous blog with uh, a lot of great content in, in all the markets we're in. And we really think that you know, traditional firms where you're a collection of independent contractors, the brand sometimes falls down on educating the consumer. So we're taking a playbook out of the tech community of, of like an intercom or a HubSpot or a buffer where... Mm. Producing consistent content and creating tools that empower the consumer. Uh, I, I think that's what people want. And I think, you know, the feedback from customers and as we've iterated over the last you know, year or two uh, has really been about, you know, I, I love that it's zero pressure and I love that you're helping me be smarter in my transaction. Yeah, I, I, I think this calculator is so good. And honestly, is I think as a sales tool, you know, you know, obviously to some degree, you guys are still a sales company. Uh, and it just, it, it, it demonstrates the value prop. And so, you know, for people who are listening to this, maybe you want to do some spying on preview, um, you know, and see how they're doing this. I think it's great. You know, so estimated closing costs, $38,400, but then right below it, save up to $20,000, click on that. And then it takes me into becoming a new buyer journey. And I, 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 you know, from a marketer perspective, this is, this is as low pressure and high value lead capture as I can think of, you know, that you're putting together here because you're giving me what I want before I even had to opt in for something. And a lot of times, you know, I feel like that gets gated and I, I you know, I, I point that out because I think that's, that says a lot about what you're trying to do as a brand and it's demonstrated through the marketing. So I can see that that's really through and through. You guys have thought through that. Um, yeah, I, I think on the marketing side, you know, we're, we're very thoughtful in how we go about it and very methodical with the frameworks we approach uh, our, our system with. Um, but when you really take a step back and look at it, nobody wants to be sold. And that's not, not only from like your customers, from a customer service perspective with these high pressure sales situations, but yep. the very first interaction with your brand, you want it to feel comfortable. You mm. don't want to be you know, pushed into anything. You don't want it to just be a generic form where it feels like it's just like, oh, I submitted something and someone's going to contact me. You have the full control and interaction with the brand the second you join the platform. Yeah. I love it. It's so good. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and I think you probably already mentioned one of these, but, you know, there's a lot of different takes as to how consumers are going to buy homes in the future moving forward. And I think now more than ever, we're really seeing a true competition for the, you know, the, the residential buyer. It's not just different agents versus different agents, but there's lots of different takes, especially on the rebate as a service portion. I'm going to stick with that, man. That is a thing. Let's yeah, make we, it a- we usually go with, uh, you know, savings oriented, but, uh, you know, rebate as a service, uh, is pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, I'm curious, how would you, how would you, what would you describe, um, sets preview apart from all the other services and platforms out there? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, there's a level of simplicity to it, right? Like I think when you look at, you know, iBuyers, most iBuyers are focused on the seller part of the business, but even the, the folks that try to convert you into an all cash buy or, or, you know, help you sell and buy at the same time, mm-hmm. it's very complex. It adds a, a layer of additional fees that get embedded into those types of transactions. Mm-hmm. And I, I think what sets us apart is that one, that simplicity and two, the transparency, you know exactly how much you're going to save in your transaction. And people want expertise. They don't want to you know, necessarily deal with financial engineering where they need to you know, read the legalese to actually understand the costs. Yeah. So I think that that, that level of transparency you know, really resonates with folks. Very cool. Let's shift gears here a little bit. So obviously you guys have just closed a round of funding and that's going to help uh, with preparations and expanding to new territories, but you've already successfully gone from one territory or, you know, city to a state, which I guess New York city is bigger than all of Connecticut, right? In terms of population. 
Uh, from a population standpoint, for sure, and, and just from a population yeah. you know, density. You know, when, we, yeah. when we think about expansion, um, you know, obviously higher price point markets um, you know, allow us to give impact for the consumer, um, yep. but also that population density um, you know, really resonates for the agent side where you can service uh, a, a much smaller footprint versus you know, driving 20, 30 minutes to every show. Yeah, what, what would you say that has really been the driving force in the growth? I think it's 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 important that it's it's something new and exciting. I think the level of transparency again is really ringing true for people. Uh, I think people have a frustration with the industry, and I think we're at a you know a real you know major paradigm shift in that you know people are accustomed to platforms in every single industry. Right? You can book stuff online for travel. You can book an Airbnb. You can click a button and get something delivered to your house. You can click Amazon and get groceries delivered to your house. Uh, at least in New York City, I don't know about every part of the country. Um, you know, we're pretty uh, fortunate with that. Close. But you can click a button and, and something's delivered to you within probably a few hours to 24 hours without it, without hitch. Right. So you're accustomed to doing a little bit more on your own. Um, so I think it's the really the brand that's going to win this category. It has to be laser focused on the customer experience, and you know, I couldn't be prouder of our team and like building these features, the communication internally between our, our real estate agents, our product people uh, and our leadership team to really look at the problems and talk to our customers and build the features that people want and really take the, that customer experience to where people want it to be going mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, purely looking at it as a financial engineering exercise. That's awesome. In, in the real estate agent uh, race, you often hear uh, agents talk about referrals are the lifeblood of their business. Um, I'm curious, you know, how maybe you guys are leveraging both the relationship aspect of having agents on the ground work, working with clients as well as tech. How have you been able to make referrals part of your business and how are you looking at that as the, you know, as a growth strategy and continue your expansion? Sure. Yeah. So when, when we look at the business, obviously, you know, we have, we have various channels in our, in our marketing, um, but now we've hit a critical mass where referrals, uh, particularly organic referrals uh, and that word of mouth referrals kicking in dramatically. Um, you know, when a traditional agent reaches out to a former client and says like, Hey, like, I'm hoping you're really settled into your home. Like, I hope, like, I hope I provided a great service. Like if you know anybody buying, like, please like refer, refer me because like referrals are a great source. Right. Right. Now I think that's super important from a relationship standpoint. We reach out to all of our customers. Um, but when you, what sets us apart, when you're sending someone a check for $20,000, $50,000 back and they go to a dinner party with their friends or someone comes over to their new apartment for the first time says, this is beautiful. Uh, I'm looking to buy. And they tell their friend, Oh, I got a check back for, $50,000, you're going to use wow. that broker. And so when you look at our reviews online uh, on Google, it's, it's tremendous, the feedback we're getting. Um, but really like I've even, you know, in the early days I was, I was definitely going to more visits uh, with our customers, but we used to deliver the checks personally. Um, <laughs> in the early That's days. a good touch. I it's like a, that. It's a great customer uh, point to get a customer uh, feedback. Um, but seeing the smiles on your face when you're handing someone a check, uh, really makes it so much more fulfilling. Um, so I think the referrals are kicking in without even like, you know, adding fuel to the fire there purely on the organic. Uh, you know, That's got to be like a viral video campaign in the making of like a compilation of handing checks to people at their front door for Christmas. I mean, it, it's probably like something out of publisher's clearinghouse. I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably dating myself on the, on the, the real fringe of a, being a millennial, but, um, but I, so I, I was on a podcast previously and someone was like, Oh, you, you actually used to showed up with like big checks. And someone's like, Did and you bring the balloons too? No balloons, but like oh. we had a huge check. One of the first, uh, first couple we did, we thought it was a bit too kitschy though. Um, but I was on a podcast and someone was like, Oh, it was like, like Ed McMahon. And one of the hosts was like, who's Ed McMahon? Oh no. So I don't know. It's a little, a little culture gap there. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to pull that name out of my head, but now that you said it, I, it, I knew exactly who you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I'm curious now. So you've been up and running for a few years, started 2015, right? 
So the company was founded in 2015. We launched the buyer product of, of the smart buyer rebate of what it is today in June of 2017. So uh, a little over two years now, and we're just over two years since our first rebate in August of 2017. Have you, or do you have like a thermometer or something counting cumulatively how much you've paid out in rebates? Yeah, so uh, we're just approaching, uh, I just actually crossed over the $3 million mark in savings for folks. So That's incredible. I mean, it's, it's an impactful number. And, and in the last few months, uh, and now post, post our, uh, our, our funding, uh, we've, the pipeline of that's going to you know, go exponential uh, you know, very quickly over the you know, coming you know, three, six months, just in the backlog of deals that are pending closing. I mean, it's, that's powerful. I mean, that doesn't, that's not chump change. And that's a lot of people getting some serious, meaningful uh, help in the closing on those transactions. Um, well, let's, let's talk about the funding because you, you kind of mentioned that a few times here. Um, so you just, uh, we quote, you mentioned at the top of the show, um, $2 million financing round, right? For seed. Correct. Yeah. So it was uh, our series seed of, uh, of funding, uh, our first institutional round, obviously. Uh, so it was led by Corrigin Ventures. Uh, we we found a, a great partner at Corrigin. You know, from the the very you know early moments of speaking with them, uh, you know, they were very clear domain expertise. They were very early investors uh, in Compass. I believe they were in the seed round of Compass in 2012. Uh, and uh, you know, as part of that, uh, Ryan Friedman, one of the GPs from Corrigin, is joining our board. Um, you know, so deep real estate domain expertise, you know, proven track record, uh, you know, a lot of great notable investments, uh, even beyond Compass. Uh, so we couldn't be happier to have, have them, uh, you know, other investments from a division of alumni ventures group, uh, Kairos, who's, you know, very active in the prop tech space with, oh, yeah. with investments like Rhino and, and a lot of other, you know, you know family offices, uh, and, uh, great investors. So we're really happy, uh, about, the the mix because when you when you go through a financing round, uh, you know obviously people look at the pure West Coast tech community, um, but when when you look at building a, a cap table, it's not just about money, right? Like we we were a profitable company. Um, obviously, we're going to more hyper growth, but we're a profitable company, and not many startups can say that. Uh, so it oh, was that, that puts you in uh, rare territory. So it's more about having the right partners at the table that can give you advice and help you build good habits to grow as a company. Mm. Uh, so I think when you look down, uh, you know, our cap table, like we couldn't be happier with, uh, with the, the people that came together uh, and believed in our vision. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're super excited uh, about the, the next 12 to 24 months. That's awesome. And, you know, congrats on doing that. Uh, a lot of businesses that even set out to accomplish that seed round, you know, aren't able to make it. I'm curious, you know, uh, maybe you can shed some light. Um, A lot of other guests we've had on the show have only just reached the seed stage um, and many of them not yet hit uh, series A. Um, But for the founders who are thinking about taking that step, you know, they're just beyond friends and family. Maybe you can describe a little bit about the process of what it takes to secure a round because uh, I, I know uh, from having worked, uh, you know, working at a venture back startup, it's not easy. It's really tough. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely takes a lot of time. And, uh, you know, I think during the fundraising process, it was like having a, a second and third job at times because you're, <laughs> you know, I, I think the one, the one key thing for all founders is uh, don't lose sight of running your business during the fundraising process. Like put in extra mm-hmm. hours after hours. Um, but don't lose sight of your business. But I think that's where a lot of people get distracted and actually, you know, drop the ball in their business. So, you know, definitely stay focused on your business. Um, anybody that hasn't started a company or is even thinking about it, make sure you have a very strong co-founder, multiple co-founders. Um, it, it can be stressful at times during that fundraising. So you, you need someone that's with you um, to help, you know, shoulder that burden. So I, I have a great co-founder in Chase Marsh. Um, so we really, you know, divided and conquered some days there were five, six, seven, you know, investor calls, everybody's got their process. Um, but as far as being successful with, it's all about, you know, having shown the traction in your business. Yeah. And I would encourage all people before you go out on the road, trying to you know, pitch investors, make sure you have a story to tell, make sure you have numbers to point to, um, yep. because the, the more you have as proof points, the, the better it is for you to go raise money. 
Um, yeah. And then once you have a story to tell, make sure you have a process of how you're reaching out to people because it's all about momentum. It's all about persistence. You know, yeah. even some of the people in the, in our round, like we had met with them two or three times over the course of three to six months, um, very early on. And like some people said no, and then joined the hopped on the deal later on because they're like, wow, <laughs> this is actually, like your, your traction is really impressive. So, um, that's yeah, but again, all all about momentum and just like finding great yeah. people that believe in your vision and and don't be discouraged. Like some people will say no. You know, one of the first lessons I learned in sales when I was selling uh, Christmas CDs door to door. I also had kitchen sets, you know, fifteen piece knife sets, that kind of thing. I thought you were but, talking about CDs, like like actual like compact discs, like. Oh yeah, I was selling Christmas CDs, like holiday mix CDs. I was going door to door. It was a bad time in life, but the point of it was, you know, in order to sell those CDs, I had to say, hey, you know, your neighbor John at the hardware store down the street just bought three of these. How many would you like? And, you know, while that was just selling $10 Christmas CD, uh, you know, (laughs) collections, I mean, it's probably something similar, right? I mean, you know, when you're talking about investors, yes, you're trying to sell your business, but at the same time, their entire, how they make money is by buying into other businesses and they don't want to miss something that's going to be awesome. Right. And, 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 and I think you, you appreciate this. You're so focused on the space, but a lot of people are approaching residential real estate with different models, different approaches, right? Um, so, and, and I have a lot of, and even more respect for, for venture capitalists going through this process because I think they get a bad rap sometimes. Um, but you're talking to hundreds and thousands of companies every single year. So you have your filtering process to say like, is this a new innovative idea? How is this different from the other stuff? So it's very easy for investors to quickly bucket stuff yeah. So you really have to make sure your differentiating points stand out very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and especially so when you look at the residential brokerage side, people say, oh, another tech enabled brokerage, but everybody else is focused on the seller side of the transaction. We're actually focused on the buyer side of the transaction. So I think there's already a quick you know, differentiating point, even beyond the, the magnitude of our savings and yeah. our traction to date. So yeah. I, I think it's, a, it's really important to, you know, get out there very quickly with how you're different um, because it's not VCs trying to be, you know, evil people by bucketing you. Um, <laughs> it's just there. They have to screen because there's meetings with so many companies. So you really have to stand yep. out from the crowd. Yeah. Well, very awesome. Let's shift here. I want to go to my favorite part of the show. This is called for the future. This is a segment where I get to ask each guest who comes on the show to give their best predictions based on the following four questions. Thomas, you ready to play? Ready to go. <laughs> All right. Question number one. Uh, what does preview look like one year from now? Yeah. So obviously with this round, I think we're excited to you know, go to new geographies and, you know, keeps you know, saving people money. You know, we anticipate being in, you know, four to five you know, major U S cities uh, in the coming, you know, 12 to 24 months. Uh, so, you know, just keep on, you know, working on our mission of, of saving uh, home buyers more money. All right. Question number two, what will the housing market look like one year from today? I think it's going to have, you know, different regional, you know, impacts, you know, mortgage rates are still, you know, historically low. I think there's, you know, a much different setup uh, currently as far as, you know, housing, you know, backlog and inventory compared to, you know, the pre-financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think we're in a different situation there. Um, You know, Certain sections of New York, you know, we've been growing rapidly, but there have been headwinds, you know, post-tax reform, uh, you know, New York City real estate markets have been, you know, softening over the last few years. So I think over the next year, we'll probably see actually an opportunity to, you know, be buyers. But, you know, there's a lot of fear around recession, stock markets at all-time highs. We're going into a presidential cycle. Uh, You know, I'd be remiss to say, um, you know, don't be selective. You You should be selective in what you're purchasing. Um, yeah, we could see, you know, a, a further softening. Um, but, you know, longer, longer term in areas like New York, you, you know, usually dips are buying opportunities, not, uh, not panics. Yeah, 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 certainly. Uh, question number three, what's one industry trend you think will continue, but you wish would go away? Yeah, so I, I, I when I 
when I look at this, I have, I've obviously heard other, other shows where people have, have talked about this. Um, I look at eye buying in particular. I don't really wish it should go away per se. Um, I'm very intrigued by it. Um, but I think there's a lot of copycats. I think there's going to be one or two big winners in that space. Hmm. Um, you know, when I say like, you know, a trend that's, you know, impactful, but you know, it likes to go away. Like in an area like Dallas, Fort Worth, obviously we're in New York, but we read, we read the press and follow the industry pretty closely. There are nine eye buyers in Dallas, Fort Worth. I think that's one of the most competitive markets actually for the iBuyer model. It's shocking. And we were obviously going through our financing round where people were like, what's your defensibility? Well, there's nine iBuyers in Dallas, Fort Worth, like, and they were all funded. And obviously we're not an iBuyer, but I look at that and say like, there's going to be one or two big winners in this category. Mm -hmm. So I think when I say the the trend, not to necessarily go away, but like the number of fragmented iBuyers will go away. I think there'll be a lot of consolidation in that group, especially if we go into a recession. I think you're, you'll really start to see those, um, those risk models be tested as you go into that first real recession since those mm-hmm. models have been in existence. Um, so when I look at that space, I think you know, there'll be one or two key winners. It'll probably be Open Door and Zillow. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if you know, they combine one day. Yeah, I mean... This whole segment's about your take on things, but I'm going to add my two cents here as well. I think you're right. Um, you can only burn for so long and so many months. And at the end of the day, that model is dependent either on raising the next round or going public. And uh, as we have all been witnessing this year has been a tumultuous year for a lot of big guaranteed successful IPOs actually struggling or limping along. And I think that, uh, you know, we're going to continue to see that trend in, in prop tech where companies that are relying on that next round, you know, as the ones get weeded out, inevitably, some are just not going to raise that next round and consolidation is going to happen. I think you're totally right on that. Yeah, and I completely agree. I think, yeah, obviously, you know, coming from a financial markets background, obviously the, the IPO calendar and what we've seen from, you know, WeWork, um, Postmates and other people pulling, pulling their IPOs, I think it should remind founders to really focus on your business, focus on profitability. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not just about raising the next round. It's, it's proving that you have real unit economics and you know how to grow, you know, sustainable revenue models. Yeah, that's good. All right. Question number four here. What's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away in real estate as a result of technological advances? Um, I, I think we're, you're already starting to see it. I think in the, in the rental market, you know, what, you know, folks like Rhino and, and other folks are doing with security deposits. Uh, you know, I think that was a big hurdle for a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, people living, especially in major cities where you have to plunk down, you know, large sums of money, um, that are just held in these escrow accounts. So I, 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 I think what, what folks like Rhino are doing are, are, are really dramatic, um, and I think, yeah, that's going to really empower, um, you know, uh, renters uh, nationwide. Uh, I'm right there with you. We had, uh, we had Omri from Obligo, uh, which is a direct competitor to Rhino, uh, also New York City based uh, on the show a few episodes back. I haven't had Rhino yet. I like them. I, I, we've chatted with a few other people on LinkedIn, but haven't gotten them on the show. We need to make that happen. Yeah. Well, when, I, when I was uh, back in the day when I was podcasting, I actually uh, had interviewed uh, you know, their CEO and I was super intrigued when I, when I heard the idea. Um, so, you know, happy to, happy to make that connection after the show. If he's, if he's game for it, I'm, I'm, sure, he, I'm sure he'd love to share this. Let's make that. Yeah, we'll make that happen. All right. We're going to move into the last three here. And these are questions for our listeners to better get to know you. Uh, first one here is what are you reading? Uh, so the last book, uh, I'm almost, well, the last book I've, I want to say finished, but I usually get to like 75% of a book and, and I just like, <laughs> I'm on to the next book just because of uh, my impatience. But, um, I read, uh, you know, marketing to the entitled consumer, uh, super intriguing book for, I think That's any marketer, title. any marketer, any entrepreneur. Um, it really talks about like how companies like Amazon and Uber, uh, have really raised the bar of, of people's expectations of a brand, of a product, of a platform. Um, and it really discusses how all people have some sense of entitlement. Um, so it's it really intriguing to understand like new viewpoints on that and consumer behavior. And I, it, it, any marketer, I think it's a, it's a must. Uh, must how did you find this book? I mean, this thing doesn't really, 
I'm not, not a dig, but I mean, you know, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a, it's a newer book. It just came out. Um, about I, a year ago. Yeah. Mascot yeah, books. I never remember where I heard about it. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, you know, they only have seven um, reviews on Amazon. So you, you might've found a, I found, I found it earlier. So I don't even, I can't even recall what podcast I heard it on, but you know, I'm my daily commute. I was listening to, um, to some marketing podcast and the author was on, uh, and it was, it was just a fascinating, you know, podcast. So I immediately went out and, and got the book and I actually bought the physical book. Usually I just download something on, you know, Apple iBooks and, and read, uh, or listen to an audio book. Yeah. It's yeah. The first physical book I've bought in a while. And, it has all your classic, you know, marketing matrices, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, I like it. I, I like the title. I, you know, I'll tell you my strategy here is I use Scribd because they do unlimited, uh, audio books for like 10 bucks a month. Uh, so I listened on two X and then if it's a resource I want, then I go buy the, I go buy the physical book almost all the time. Uh, all right. Question number two, who are you learning from? So I think, yeah, going back to podcasts, I listen to a lot of, a lot of podcasts. I think listening to other entrepreneurs, um, whether it's, you know, founders or VCs, I, I think hearing people's stories, I think there's a lot of patterns in life, patterns in companies, patterns in industries. Um, so I think listening to as many podcasts as possible um, really will you know, give you a lot of great um, facts and a lot of good tidbits to, to bring to your own business. Uh, you know, as far as the, the key ones I tend to listen to, like This Week in Startups with Jason Kalkanis, he has a lot of great guests. Oh, yeah. Um, we recently went out to his Launch Scale Conference, which was, you know, he, he puts on a fantastic uh, program there with a, a lot of great uh, speakers. So I, I think just hearing other people's journeys, you, you learn stuff for your business, but you also learn that it's, it's not these, you know, survivor bias, uh, you know, stories where like, oh, like, yeah, and then it went up and to the right. Like, <laughs> like you need to hear that, like, things ebb and flow and um, you're always iterating and learning. So I think yeah. listening to, you know, other, other folks like that really uh, can be powerful for, for your learning process. Yeah, I agree. Uh, last one here, what inspires you? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, when, when you look at anything you're doing, like, I think there's a certain level of the impact you're having with people. Uh, and I think with what we're doing with saving home buyers money has really brought uh, a new sense of purpose and new sense of mission in terms of how we can impact people's lives. Uh, and, and I mentioned it earlier, but it, it rings true. Uh, when, when you see the smile on someone's face, when you're handing them a big check and you know, you think, what, what will they do with that rebate? You know, some people are going to renovate that home. Some are people going to, you know, furnish that extra room that they would have otherwise had to save up for. Um, or maybe take a vacation or, or pay for that extra school fee or, or college tuition. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having that, you know, sense of impact is, has really been a, a big driver for me personally and for, for us as a company. Let's be real. If they're under 30, it's gone towards college tuition. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, I think nowadays, I think obviously, I think sometimes, you know, people are subconsciously having less children um, because after the first one, they start planning for college and they realize, wait, I, I, I can barely afford this one. So, yeah. Uh, and I think when you look at across, like whether it's real estate or, or children or everything else, like there's a growing affordability crisis in major cities. Um, you know, you see it in New York, but like, you know, obviously we were at that conference recently in San Francisco and when you look at, you know, uh, like homelessness crisis and other things like, uh, you know, it, it's going to become a, a, a bigger and bigger issue, you know, nationwide. Um, so yeah. I think to be able to be part of that fix, um, uh, you know, home buyers is only one part of it, but I think when you can impact people's lives like that and make it more affordable, yeah. um, it is, is really fulfilling. I don't know who said it, but it was like some, I think it was like some Marine or something like that is quoted. Like if you want to change the world, make your bed, you know, you kind of start from there and you just kind of move on and you're kind of describing that, like you, you can't do everything, but you know, you're tackling some of those challenges, uh, you know, and helping each and every buyer along the way like that. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And when you think about it, right, like 80 to a hundred billion is spent every year on real estate commissions. Uh, you know, it, it Think about how impactful that is when you compare it to what you know governments are trying to to do and uh, and what you know private charities are trying to do. That, that's a that's a large portion of money that would be better served uh, mm -hmm. in people's pockets for their lives. 
That's very good. Uh, Thomas, I, I really appreciate the time and you sharing everything about what Preview is doing, how you guys are working. Uh, I'm really digging the calculators. I mean, it's got my wheels spinning on how I can create something similar for the avail uh, landlords. <laughs> so uh, kind of cool there. Um, but before we close out, I want to give everyone opportunity if they want to learn more about Preview or they want to connect with you. Where do they go and how do they do that? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I like to be very accessible for pe- accessible for people. So, uh, you know, I'm happy for people to email me. It's, you know, thomas at preview.com. Uh, also, uh, obviously I'm very active on social media, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, etc. It's simply at Thomas Kutzman. There we go. And, and, uh, you know, all the links and everything will be in the descriptions below, but preview is P R E V U dot com and so uh for for everyone who would uh, maybe listening in the car just check it when you pull over and <laughs> get the the links in the notes but hey i really appreciate it uh let's keep in touch i'm definitely going to follow up with you on that uh referral to rhino uh and others and uh root for you guys can't wait to see where you expand next i hope it's pennsylvania but uh you'll have to let me know when you guys figure it out but um yeah looking forward to uh keeping in touch and seeing what you guys do great thanks so much for having me Nate. All right. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening to the Tech Nest podcast. Hey, don't forget, you can get on the email list. You never miss an upcoming episode. That's technest.io. That's T-E-C-H-N-E-S-T dot I-O. Get on the email list. Uh, go to the App Store, whether you found us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you found us. Leave us a five-star review and share it with your friends. And if you've got a guest or someone that you'd like to recommend, or if you think that you'd be a great guest on the show, hey, send me an email, nate at realteampanda.com. That's nate at realteampanda.com. See you guys later.